Hi. Happy Mother's Day. This is a great weekend for us to just enjoy, give honor to whom honor is due, to value and respect the people who have given so much to us. So y'all, I'm going to bring you in on a thing, okay? So here's a thing. So my mom is 86, and isn't it great that we can honor our moms at any age, and I'm so blessed to still have my mom, and she lives in Ohio, and she has sacrificed. We, we lived in Dayton before we, we came here, so she, my mother has sacrificed me being close for us to, to minister to y'all. So would you join me, and she's going to watch this video later. She's not obviously watching it live stream, but I'm going to, on one, two, three, I'm going to, would you yell with me, hi, mom? All right. And she will love that. She will cry. All right. She, she's like me amplified. That's my mom's personality. So she doesn't know a stranger. Everybody loves my mom. If you meet her, you will love her. She talks to anybody. She's a wonderful mother. I was blessed. So she's like the grandmom of the house, right? She really is. And I wish you had an opportunity to meet her. They don't travel anymore. So one, two, three. Hi, mom. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day, mom. All right. We are going to talk about a story tonight. The story is of Sarah's life. And it's a precious story of devastation and damage and hope, and renewal, and redemption. All right, when I read the scriptures, I want you to follow carefully. Let the word penetrate your heart. The word does something that I can't do, and that is reach somewhere deep within you and heal something. All right, that's reaching somewhere deep within you and giving you a word of wisdom for this moment, reaching way down into your soul and providing something for you, you cannot come up with yourself. That's the power of God's word. Again, Pastor Mike so eloquently introduced our damaged to dust and kickoff. They gave me Sarah. And I felt like the Holy Spirit gave me the topic chosen and not rejected. So I'm gonna give you a little intro to Sarah's story. All right, Abram and Sarai were married for decades. They tried to have kids. They could not conceive. And Sarai was damaged by this long-term pain. She went 90 years, 90 years, hoping, praying, watching other people have babies, talking with her husband, maybe this month, maybe this month, maybe this month, praying, then stopping praying, having hope, then giving up hope. She was hurt. She was disappointed. She was damaged by long-term pain. I'm sure there are times when she was very angry with God. I'm sure there was times when she said to herself, okay, it's over. I've now gone through menopause. I am officially unable to have children. The dream is dead. How many of you have had to face a dead dream? And uh, y'all, I'm talking to the men as well as the women tonight. So when you face a dead dream, there's something that happens on the inside of you that's so hard and so tough, you feel like there's no other option for me but to completely let this go and die to that and, and move forward. And I believe that's what Sarah did. But something happens to us. We bear a brokenness when that happens. And the brokenness is what Sarah was living with for decades. Then, suddenly, there was a God moment. Throw up Genesis 15, one through four, guys. Genesis 15, one through four says this. After these things, the word of the Lord. After all these bad things and hard things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Abram also said, since you have given me no son, one who has been born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This is the suddenly... 
saying, this man will not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Whoa, suddenly a wow moment, a son from Abram's old own body. Now listen, you may have never heard this point before. Listen carefully. Since Abram was married to only Sarai, he didn't have 10 wives, he had one wife. Her name was Sarai. Obviously, God was referring to her and their marriage and their conceiving and Sarah's involvement in this promise. He wasn't referring to a a slew of women or concubines. He had one wife. Stop and think that through. Okay, so Sarah's involvement, wow, exciting. She'd been waiting all these years. That's good news for Sarai, right? But wait, uh uh-oh, something's happening. In the very next chapter, all right, here's chapter 15. In the very next chapter, chapter 16, things take a bad turn. As Sarai's long-term misery manifests in a terrible decision, If you've ever had long-term misery or difficulty and damage, you know you can make bad choices at those points. You see, listen, the time delay between the God moment of chapter 15, when God spoke to Abram, to the terrible decision Sarai's about to make in chapter 16 was about 10 years. Enough time for the devil to mess with Sarai's thinking. And she convinced herself that God needed help to fulfill his promise. You ever done that before? I've done that before. God, I think you're taking a little bit too much time. Can we get moving here? This is a little slow. And can I do anything to get you moving, God? Have you ever been there, baby? Have you ever been there? (laughs) We need help. So obviously, God needs help, so I'll do what I can. Remember, again, in chapter 15, God promised Abram a son from his own body. So they're both talking about and thinking about and dwelling on that. So Sarai must have carnally reasoned. Well, God didn't mention me by name in chapter 15, even though I'm, I'm your only wife. So how's that going to happen without me? But God didn't mention my name in his promise. He only mentioned you, Abram. Well, listen, God didn't mention Sarai's name because he was going to change her name. Listen, Sarai means my princess. When she was born... The name Sarai sounded royal. She must have been born in a royal lineage to a small family. So my princess. He was going to change it to Sarah, which means princess in a large encompassing sense, in a large giant sense. But... Overwhelmed by the damage of her own emotional life and tired of waiting. Oh my goodness, do you ever get tired of waiting? Sarai began listening to Satan, whispering in her ear, he's our enemy. His words partner with our emotions to create disaster. So here's our emotions Here's Satan speaking in our ear quietly, unrecognizable, because he sounds like he makes sense. Come on. He sounds like he makes sense. What you're saying seems to be realistic. I believe the devil said something like this. You are not included in God's promise. He hasn't chosen you. He's chosen Abram. He has rejected you, and now you are old. Do you imagine you can be so fruitful at your age? God himself has prevented you from having children. You're not good enough. Your life is a broken down mess. Give Abram your slave. 
That must have been what God meant when he said Abram would have a son from his own body. Maybe a slave can build you a family. Satan whispers in our ears too the things he wants us to latch onto to believe about ourselves, to believe about our circumstances, to believe about our family, to believe about our children, to believe about our lives. He wants you to believe that God has failed you and that he won't come through. That somehow along the road, he's, he's thought you were important, but now he's dropped you like a lead balloon. That you're only imagining he spoke a word of promise to you. Have you ever been there? God's spoken something and it's taken so long that you start to think, I've, I only just imagined that. That really didn't happen. That was probably just me overthinking. He wants you to believe you are not chosen. He wants you to feel rejected so you will make mistakes that will lead to poor results. The truth was, the truth was God chose Sarai I want, I want you to listen carefully to this. There are gold nuggets that God gave me all through this message, and this is one of them. The truth was God chose Sarai from her youth because she was barren. God was setting Sarai apart, saving her womb for a miraculous divine assignment. Long waits often produce large miracles. Sarah was to bear a son of God's covenant, Isaac. Sarah would hold in her womb a country, Israel. Sarah was called to be a mother of nations. You see, Sarai most likely was from Hittite origin. By the way, she was buried in the cave of Machpelah, which was a Hittite cave. I believe his name is Ephraim. Ephraim, the Hittite, sold the cave to Abram. There's a reason why they went that direction. Her idol-worshiping Hittite roots had caused her to be a royal princess in a small sense. So when God ordered Abram, Abraham, to change her name, Sarai, to Sarah, listen to this, he said, you shall not call her Sarai, Abraham, but Sarah. Now listen, that wording was akin to the Ten Commandment language. That's important. When God says something like that and he emphasizes that, you shall not call her Sarai anymore. There's a reason why that language is akin to the Ten Commandments because the name Sarai may have and probably did represent a royal lineage of idol worshipers and God was calling her apart completely, setting her apart and thus honoring her with a new name, Sarah, royal princess of God's people. She was, I may be, and I love and am honored to be the mother of this house. Sarah was about to be a mother of nations. She was set apart for something so amazing that the barrenness was a cross she had to bear in order to bear the miracle. Satan wanted to deceive Sarai to make the most of her emotional damage, to attempt to cut off the nation from which the Messiah would come, and that was Israel. He wanted to make sure she was confused enough to use a slave to try to build a family because he wanted to cut off his his enemy, his arch enemy, the Messiah, who was going to come Now let's read about Sarah's mistake. 
because from her emotional damage came a bad mistake. Let's read Genesis 16, 1 through 4. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not borne him a child, but she had an Egyptian slave woman whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, see now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please have relations with my slave woman. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. I bet he, <laughs> I bet he really hated himself for that for years afterwards. And so after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife Sarai took Hagar the Egyptian, her slave woman, and gave her to her husband Abram as his wife. Then he had relations with Hagar and she conceived. And when Hagar became aware that she had conceived, her mistress was insignificant in her sight. You know, I call this the mistake in the middle. Here's chapter 15, a good word from the Lord, solid word. You guys are going to have a son. Uh Uh-oh, wait a minute. Here comes chapter 16, where Hagar is being used to try to fulfill that promise. Had she just waited to chapter 17 through 21, Sarai would have never experienced that awful pain and division in her family. I call that the mistake in the middle. Don't make a mistake in the middle of your trial, my friends. Don't think for yourself. You can do it in a fleshly, carnal way and come up with an option that's better than God's option. When you do those things, that mistake in the middle will be like an anchor to you and you will have to deal with it. And guess what the Middle East is dealing with right now today? Hagar and Sarah. Ishmael and Isaac. Had Sarai known what she was doing and what that would eventually cause in the world she would have said, I can handle my damage a little bit longer and my emotional distress. Maybe I should go back and revisit chapter 15 and God's original promise to us, and I will go back and say, wait a minute, I'm Abram's only wife. This can only happen through me. But she let herself be led astray. She didn't inquire of God or listen to her checks in her spirit. You know, I taught my children growing up, mind the checks. Mind them. When God gives you a check in your heart or your spirit or your mind, pay attention. I'm sure Sarah, Sarai, overwhelmed herself with her emotional damaged issues that she did not Listen, the delay, the disappointment, the pain of her family situation caused her to stop listening to God. And the result of her impatience, maybe her momentary prayerlessness, not listening to God, was Hagar. All right, catch this. Hagar comes from the term ha-agar, which means this is the reward. Can you hear the voice of Satan in that? the voice of the enemy. This is the reward of your impatience, of getting tangled up in messy conclusions God never meant to happen. He, I believe Satan mocked her when, when Hagar became pregnant with, with Ishmael because he was saying, this is your reward for your impatience. Hagar's very name My friends, making carnal, fleshly decisions when we are at our wit's end. We stop listening to God, and often the results are catastrophic rewards. Not at all what we would hope had happened in our lives or with the situation. Not at all what we had planned. All right, let's jump to chapter 17 through 21, where God turns... Sarai's damaging emotions, damaging circumstances, and even her damaging mistake into her divine destiny because God never leaves us at the damage point. God turns the corner. Now here's all the good stuff. Sarai made a a 
bad mistake. And it has cost the world dearly, and it cost her family dearly. But God didn't leave her there. Let's read Genesis 17, 15, and 16. Then God said to Abraham, as for your wife Sarai, you shall not call her by the name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Come on. Kings of peoples. Man, she went from barren to the mother of kings of peoples. That's God's type of turnaround. Now, I think in our vernacular today, God was all like, Sarai, if you had not just jumped to conclusions, if you had paid attention to my original wording, if in your conversations with your husband, you would have trusted the Lord in your heart for just a little bit longer, if you would not allow the enemy to convince you you're rejected, chapter 16 would never have happened. But I'm a merciful, kind, loving, gracious, and, I t- and I'm a tender-hearted God, and I have come to tell you good news anyway. Despite your mistake, despite what's happened, despite the difficulty of 90 years, I have come to tell you some good news. At this moment, right at that moment, God did several things. He changed Sarai's name. He presented her with a new calling. He revealed her destiny, and he gave her three personal promises. These are the promises. Number one, I will give you a son not by a pagan slave, but in your own womb. I will do what I originally spoke to you. I will give you and Abram a son. Number two, I will bless you. Now, the Hebrew word for bless in there is really interesting. It's congratulate and abundantly bless. God of the universe was congratulating Sarah on receiving his word that she was going to have a son. How interesting is that? God's congratulating her. Number three, I will make you a mother of nations and kings will come from you. All right, all right, all right. Things are turning around. Things are shifting. Things are looking up. God is doing something new here. God is saying, hey, I started this in chapter 15. You messed up in chapter 16 in the middle. You made a mistake in the middle, but I am going to turn everything around. I am going to be the God who redeems your situation, who fulfills all my promises to you. I am a true God. I am a faithful God, and I will be gracious and kind. I will take what you have done, and I will flip it around, and I will say no. Na 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 boo boo to the enemy. And God began a work at that moment, and she absolutely took it in, right? No. <laughs> Let's read Genesis 18, 9 through 15. Then they said to him, Where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. He said, I will certainly return to you at this time next year, and behold, your wife Sarah will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door. Pay attention to that. Sarah was standing at the tent door listening to this conversation, which was behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. Sarah was way past childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have become old, am I to have pleasure, my Lord being old also? (laughs) But the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I actually give birth to a child when I am so old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, oh, oh no, you did laugh because he's God. Now, well, listen, 
Why did God ask Sarah, or I'm sorry, God asked Abraham, where is Sarah? God knows. He sees all. He knows all. He knew Sarah was in the tent. Do you ever ask yourself that? Well, why did God ask, where is Sarah? Look at the next, look at the next phrase. Sarah was listening at the tent door. God was not asking about her whereabouts, but to find out if this time Sarah was listening to God instead of stopped listening to God when the Hagar thing happened. Understand, God was intent because he wanted her to be blessed. He wanted her to be filled with the knowledge of his forgiveness, of his grace. And he wanted to make sure this woman was listening to the good news. Are you listening to the good news tonight? God loves you. God will redeem everything that's happened to you. And you know, you have to forgive me when the Holy Spirit comes over me. I cry. I wish I didn't. It would be a lot easier for me. But I feel like he wants me to tell you this, that you've been thinking it's impossible for your situation to be redeemed, for for God to come and fix and restore and help you and help your children that God wasn't paying attention, that your children are right now in the land of the enemy and God can't can't or won't or hasn't gotten them back. The Holy Holy Spirit wants you to know that in the next year at the appointed time, you will have your children back in your home and they will be redeemed from the land and the hand of the enemy. You know, after getting Sarah's attention, saying, I want to make sure Sarah's listening this time. Chapter 15, she wasn't a good listener. But here, she needs to be a good listener because this time next year, you're going to have a son, Sarah. Now, Sarah, still operating at that moment, standing at the tent with a lot of pain, a lot of disappointment, a lot of damaged emotions, She reacted out of those damages. She laughed at God's word, number one. And that is a very mocking term in the original Hebrew language. In Midwest speak, it's like, yeah, buddy. (laughs) Yeah, buddy. Sounds really likely that at 90, I'm going to have a baby. So it's a mocking term. Number two, then she lied to God after she laughed and kind of mocked him, and then she lied to God, the God of the universe is standing outside your tent. You're lying to him. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? Have you ever lied to God? Everybody in this room has lied to God. And number three, she reacted in fear towards God because, listen, I believe her thoughts were, oh, I suppose now I'm going to be big time rejected. Not just little time rejected, but now because I laughed and I lied, I'm afraid that now God's really going to reject me. Now I want you to pay close attention here. Don't let your mind wander. I love how God responds to Sarah here. He knows all the damaged places in her life. He knows all the damaged places in your life. He knows the rejection in your life and he knew it in her life. He knew the pain in her heart. He knows the pain in your heart. He treated her very gently and very carefully. Number one, he repeats twice to her, you're going to bear a son. He wanted to to reinforce his direct promise right to her, not to her husband, but right to her. Number two, God sets an appointed time for her, giving her mind relief from the warfare of her never-ending nightmare of if and when. Do you ever have a, a reoccurring, damaging thought process that says, 
Is God going to intervene? And when is God going to intervene? It's a cycle. And it can become a pattern in your mind where it sows doubt and unbelief. And until that is downloaded in your spirit, and that's a troubling situation because the enemy does a lot of further damage when that happens. Number three, he not only sets an appointed time, but he offers no condemnation and no rejection for her laughing for her faltering faith, or even for her lying. He doesn't offer condemnation. He simply undergirds what faith she did have by reassuring her. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? That's a gracious, kind, tenderhearted, loving response to a woman who has been through decades of difficulty and decades of damage. Let's look at Genesis 21, one through seven. We're gonna look at some amazing moments in Sarah's life here. Then the Lord took note of Sarah, and that word took note in the original Hebrew is looked graciously upon. As he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At the appointed time of which God had spoken to him, Abraham named his son who was born to him, the son whom Sarah born to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me and everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have given birth to a son in his old age. The Lord did for Sarah exactly as he had promised at the appointed time. God turned Sarah's rejection into into joyful laughter. God has made laughter for me and everyone who hears it will laugh with me. Now, friends, I want to take this moment to talk to you personally. I've told you this story faithfully, digging out gold nuggets for you to download and you to keep and you to say, if God will do it for one person on the earth, he will do it for all of us. He loves us that very much. Despite the damage in your life, despite your own mistakes, the Hagar slavery choices you've made that has caused yourself problems. Despite emotional brokenness, this is God's promise to you. I prayed over this. I said, God, I want to deliver something people can count on that you're speaking. Number one, this is what I felt like he was saying to you. Out of the damage in your life will be born a divine purpose-filled calling. He will use what you determine as brokenness and he will create something beautiful. All my friends who are called go through fire, all. And if you want to serve Christ on this earth, you are going to go through the fire. And out of that fire will be born a divine purpose-filled calling. You will touch lives you never believed you could ever touch. You will impact people you never imagined you could impact. Your name will be associated with the name of Jesus and with the name of the kingdom of God forever and ever and ever because you endured the fire and you accepted the calling on your life including all the damages it takes to get there. Number two, I believe that God said to me, You're an appo- God has an appointed time for your deliverance day. Don't try to make it happen through your flesh. Only do what he tells you to do. Nothing else. Don't try to create a Hagar in your life. 
that you'll regret forever and ever. But simply wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and wait on the Lord. Number three, God has not rejected you. He has chosen you. Just like Sarai was chosen in her barrenness, you are chosen in your current situation, and you may feel barren. You may feel like, God, where are you? I'm not producing any fruit. I'm lost. I feel sad all the time. I feel like I'm in darkness. I feel like my purpose is lost. I feel like my dream is dead. God, help me. And he is saying, I have chosen you to walk through these valleys, even the valleys of the shadows of death, because I trust you enough that when you have come out of it, you are going to be a spectacular vision of my grace and mercy to the world. You are going to be something that other people look to and they say, if God can do it for her or him, God can do it for me. You are going to be able to stand up and tell others of God's faithfulness. You're going to be able to say, God's word is real. When he speaks it, it happens. When he promises, he fulfills. I believe God says to you, is anything you've been through, is anything you are now walking through too difficult for the Lord to heal, to restore, to mend, and to birth new hope into? You are not too far gone. Neither are your children. You are not too old to see a turn around. You are not too damaged to be restored. You are not too far gone for God to make something spectacular out of your situation. All your circumstances are redeemable. Every one of them. You are chosen to display the riches of His grace, the blessings of His mercy, the kindness of His heart. And when, my friends, He acts on your behalf, others are going to say, I can be redeemed from my damage and my barrenness, and I can begin again. God can birth something from me that will impact the world forever and ever. Bow your heads with me. Those people here that want to receive that kind of redemptive, work of the Holy Spirit. Would you raise your hand? I'm going to pray over you. You want to receive that redemptive work from damage to to just a chosen trajectory of power. Okay, keep raising your hands. Keep them up. I'm going to pray over you. Father God, you see the raised hands right now. You see people who deeply desire for you to do something new, for a new birth to come upon them, for a new moment of redemption to visit their lives, for the damage and the pain and the difficulty to be turned around in a sudden moment of God's intervention. Lord God, you see each hand, each heart, each mind. Turn their situations around. Give them a Genesis 17 through 21. Give them words of confirmation from your word. Give them uh, words of confirmation as they listen to the radio, as they listen online, as they listen to Spotify. Lord, speak to their hearts. Allow them to be confirmed in their spirit. Yes, this was God. He spoke to me through Lisa's message. This is the word of the Lord to me. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Thanks for watching Crossroads Community Church online. We'd love to hear that you are here today. You can fill out our online connection card with your prayers, praises, and any questions you have at crossroadscn.com slash connection. Links are also provided in our bio. If you want to stay up to date, check out our website for upcoming events that are happening at your campus. Thanks again for watching. God bless.